In this video, I'm going to introduce you to two-stage DCF models. We'll talk about why you might want to use some of these models, and then I'll go through an example involving a two-stage DCF model with a couple of modifications. And then finally, I'll discuss why we might want to use some more complicated models like a three-stage DCF model. So in the last video, I introduced the single stage DCF model where we either calculated free cash flows to equity or free cash flows to the firm. And we assumed that those free cash flows continued to grow at a constant rate. If we're talking about the free cash flows to the firm, we're growing that free cash flow amount by one plus a certain growth rate. And our discount rate is the weighted average cost of capital. If we're talking about the free cash flows to equity, again, we apply a growth rate and then our discount rate is going to be the required return or sometimes this is called the market cap rate. Either way, we use the cap M to predict this. Now, there are a couple of problems when using the one stage DCF model. The first problem is that you could have a case where cash flow is negative. So let's say in the next year or two, you expect a firm's cash flow to be negative. Let's say there's been a worldwide pandemic and nobody wants to ride in a cruise liner. So Royal Caribbean or Norwegian Cruise Lines, they're running a negative free cash flow over the next year, the next two years, what have you. That's pretty abnormal. We would normally expect that if they can weather this storm, they would return to positive free cash flow. So one of the benefits of having a two-stage DCF model is that you can take into account the negative free cash flows in the immediate period while still recognizing that the firm will turn a positive free cash flow in, let's say, three years, four years, five years, what have you. Going along with that, if you have any kind of abnormal conditions, you can reflect that in the forecasting period cash flows, the cash flows over the next three to five years. And finally, and this is going to be true of the three-stage DCF model. If your firm is experiencing any kind of super normal growth, let's say extremely high growth in the next year or two, and then maybe it comes down to, let's say, a 15% growth rate in free cash flows, and then eventually a 10% and a 5%, and then it eventually matures and starts to grow its free cash flow at the long-term growth rate in the overall economy, the two-stage DCF model is going to be perfect for calculating the intrinsic value based on that information, although admittedly a three-stage model will also do a pretty good job of that. So let's go through the basic steps when using the free cash flows to the firm and a two-stage DCF model. So step one is to estimate your free cash flow to the firm each year, next year, next two years maybe three years out, maybe as far as five years out. It all depends on how accurate the information you're putting in is. There are some cases where your best estimates of free cash flows are only going to be accurate out to about three years. For some firms, their free cash flows have been estimated by analysts already going out about five years. Obviously, we want to use our own estimates of free cash flow if we can, but this does illustrate the point that you may be able to estimate your free cash flows to the firm out to about five years. So here is the free cash flows to the firm formula that I like to use if I have all the necessary inputs. So earnings before interest and taxes, this is going to be operating income. We multiply that by one minus our corporate tax rate plus our depreciation expense on the income statement minus the change in capital expenditures, so PP and E. And then we also subtract out the change in networking capital since increases in assets like inventory are going to lead us to need to expend some cash. So the higher the change in networking capital, the, the less free cash flow we have. Okay, after you've estimated your free cash flows over the next three to five years in the forecasting period, it's time to estimate the terminal value period cash flow. And there's two ways to do that. You can either use market multiples, I'll show you that in the example, or you can use a constant growth formula. So the DDM formula, it's sometimes called the Gordon growth model. This would be the formula that you want to use here. Step three, discount all your free cash flows at the weighted average cost of capital. So the WAC 
is your discount rate for the entire firm. It represents the overall cost of raising the next dollar's worth of capital. And since your free cash flows to the firm are going not just to the shareholders, but also to the bondholders, to preferred shareholders, we need a discount rate that reflects the cost of raising money that could go to all of those parties. After that, to make sure that the free cash flows that we have left are actually going to the shareholders, we need to subtract out the debt and add the cash. And there may be a few other line items that we include here. If we have preferred stock, we'd want to subtract that out. If we have uh, anything else, we might need to do something with that. But these are the two main components that you'll want to address. And then finally, we'll want to divide that final number by shares outstanding, and that will give us an intrinsic share price. So let's take a look at this two-stage DCF model. The first component that we have is the forecasting period, and that's this period in the first couple of years when you're able to accurately individually estimate each period's free cash flows to the firm. So FCFF1 would be your free cash flows to the firm over the next year. FCFF2 would be free cash flows to the firm two years from now, and we'll discount those free cash flows back to the present at the weighted average cost of capital. At some point, however, you're not going to be able to estimate these free cash flows accurately. And so that's where the Gordon growth model or the constant growth model comes in. Because you need to estimate all of these free cash flows from the start of year three off into perpetuity, so to infinity. And there's a couple of ways to do this. The best way to do it is going to be using this formula right here. This is our single stage formula from our previous video. This is sometimes referred to as the Gordon growth model. It assumes that we grow our free cash flows at a constant growth rate, and our discount rate is the weighted average cost of capital. So this formula will give us the price of all of these free cash flows starting after year two, off into perpetuity, discounted back to year two. And then once we have that value, which becomes this P here, we just discount that back to the present at the weighted average cost of capital. And that's exactly what we're going to do in the example. Now, the two-stage FCFE approach is slightly different. We use a lot of the same steps, but let's start off with step one. Again, we are going to try and estimate our FCFE for each year that we're able, usually our estimates are only accurate for about three to five years. And FCFE, there's a couple of formulas you can use, but if you have FCFF already, you can subtract from that the interest expense, INT times one minus the tax rate. And you will also want to account for the change in debt. So this is net borrowing. So let's say the firm is expected to borrow a million dollars next year. Well, that cash that is received by bondholders who purchase those bonds, that is free cash flow. And if we wanted to, if we were fairly unscrupulous, well, we could certainly convert that into, let's say, dividends that would benefit the shareholders. We account for any increases in debt right here. So positive changes in net debt go right here. But if we've made, let's say, principal payments, we're going to be decreasing the debt, or at least we'll, we'll have a negative value here. We've, we've uh, paid off part of the debt, and that's a cash outflow from our perspective, and so our, our change would be negative. All right, step two, estimate the terminal value period. Same thing here, we can use market multiples or the constant growth formula. After that, we discount all the free cash flows to equity at a required return, so we're going to use the cap M here. Uh, and then notice here that unlike the previous FCFF formula, we don't have to subtract out debt and add the cash. And the reason for that is because these FCFEs, this represents the free cash flow to the shareholders, to equity. And we've already taken out the, the benefit to bondholders in the interest, and we've accounted for changes in debt. So all we need to do is divide our FCFE, or rather our intrinsic market cap, by the number of shares outstanding, and that will get us the intrinsic price per share. So let's just go through this again. So just like in the previous example, we have a couple of expected free cash flows, only this time they're FCFEs. In the first couple of years, 
we should be able to estimate those free cash flows to equity fairly accurately. And so those first two cash flows, we'll put those in what's called the forecasting period. And here we individually estimate each of our free cash flows to equity. After that period, we'll assume that we're not going to be as accurate when forecasting those free cash flows. So what we want to do is we want to take our FCFE in the second year and assume that it grows at a constant rate. And that rate will be G. What we'll do is we'll use this, the constant growth model and that'll allow us, allow us to calculate the, the value at year two of all these FCFEs discounted back to year two at the discount rate at the required rate of return that we calculate using cap m so all of this right here and all of this right here after the second fcfe is going to equal the price that this stock should be worth in year two and then we just discount discount all of those fcfes and the terminal value back to the present so FCFE1 will be discounted by 1 plus our required return to the first, and then these others are going to be discounted at uh, a higher, well, over a longer period. Now, there are a couple of additional points I should say here. First, I usually recommend that when you use discounted cash flows, you do use a two-stage DCF model. Uh, the reason for this is that it allows you to account for changes in the immediate future where you're estimates are going to be more accurate. And speaking of estimates, if you see that your firm has analyst forecasts, you could use those. Although if we're doing our job, we should be able to estimate free cash flows fairly accurately ourselves. And we often don't want to rely on analyst forecasts of free cash flows. We want to do our own research because if those analyst forecasts are inaccurate, it's still our valuation. I mean, we are putting out our own valuation and we can't say, hey, we, we messed up our valuation because our, the analysts whose forecasts we used got it wrong. Now, there is the possibility to extend this DCF model. So let's say we want to use something a little more complicated. The three-stage model allows you to essentially not only include a forecast period, but also include different periods with different growth rates in free cash flows. So let's say in the first year we have a forecasting period where we individually forecast sales growth. So in year one, let's say one year from now, the sales revenue will be 20% greater than it was this, this year. Uh, year after that, it's going to be 10%. Year after that, it'll be 15%. And then in the second stage, let's say our information isn't as accurate. Well, we might not be able to accurately individually estimate each free cash flow, but we can make an educated guess that the free cash flow growth rate will still be higher than it will be at when the firm is mature. So what we can do is in this intermediate period, the second period, we can assume a fairly high growth rate in free cash flows. And then in the third period, we allow our free cash flow growth rate to fall to whatever the long-term growth rate is in the overall economy. So in the U.S., I, you could argue that it'd be about 2%. Now, the big question is, how do we individually estimate those forecasting period free cash flows? And there's really two approaches here. One, I am definitely a much bigger fan of. Uh, let's start off with the, the line item approach. And the line item approach, I hate to say there's not really a better name for this, but in this approach, what you do is you individually estimate each line item on the pro forma financial statements. And pro forma just means forecasted financial statements. Uh, so this approach involves you going through an, an enormous amount of information, which you should already be doing, but it does require you to individually input each sales number for next year, the year after that, the year after that, et cetera, expected depreciation two years out, three years out, what have you, PPE, current assets, two years out, three years out, if you're using the FCFF formula. So this approach, it's a bit tedious. It's a bit cumbersome. That's why I tend to lean toward the second approach, and that is the percent of sales approach. And the percent of sales approach, this involves us estimating future sales and then assuming that line items 
or a large number of the line items tend to grow in proportion with the sales growth rate. So if our, our sales growth rate is 5%, then chances are our operating expenses might also grow by 5%. And then once we have our data on our pro forma financial statements, what we'll do is we'll take that information and calculate our, our future cash flows, our future FCFFs or future FCFEs. Now, I think it would be helpful to look at a proper example involving a two-stage DCF model. So what I've done here is I've put together some data and we're going to calculate the intrinsic value using this data and compare it to the share price and make a valuation recommendation just based solely on the intrinsic value, uh, not considering any other factors. So over here in the top left, we have some inputs. So we know our expected operating expense margin over the next five years. We know our depreciation as a percentage of PPE. We know shares outstanding, PPE growth, tax rate, and then we also know our discount rates. So weighted average cost of capital and the required return. And we'll also use this number. So the comparable firm's price to sales ratio. What this is gonna allow us to do is use the market multiples approach in the terminal value. And I realized that my price to sales ratio for the comparable firm is incredibly high. But hey, my sales revenue per share is, is also quite low. So let's get started. Notice here that we have two distinct parts to this model. We have the historical information. So information in 20X0 and then information in the current year of 20X1. And then we have five years for which we're going to fill in data and these are going to be pro forma financial statements or a pro forma income statement where we forecast all of these different uh, components, I guess. We have components from the income statement and the balance sheet here. So it's really just pro forma financial statements. Okay, so let's start off with sales revenue. Here, I've given you an expected sales growth rate. And the way we typically input or calculate or estimate these, these growth rates is by using macroeconomic information or industry information, usually both, and then looking at the firm's information and making a determination as to how much you expect their sales revenue to grow year over year over the next couple of years. Well, you can see here that the firm's sales are growing year over year, but that growth rate is declining. And so it's declining to probably the the long-term growth rate in whatever economy this, this firm is operating in. So our sales revenue in the first forecasted year is going to be sales revenue from the previous year times one plus our sales growth rate. And there we go, I've copied it across. Next, we're going to assume that our operating expense in 20X2 is 81.54% of our sales revenue. So this is part of the, the percent of sales approach. We estimate the sales growth rate, and then we assume certain line items grow at the same percentage as our sales. So here we're keeping this 81.54% operating margin from the current year, and we're, we're carrying it forward. So what we'll do is we'll set our sales or for, forecasted sales times our operating expense margin. And we'll lock that in. And carry it across. Next, we need our operating income. And operating income is sometimes our, it's referred to as EBIT. Uh, I just kept it in here because sometimes you'll see operating income, sometimes you'll see EBIT or earnings before interest and taxes. These things mean one and the same. Okay, next we need our interest expense. And here I'm assuming that our change in interest expense year over year is going to be zero. You could argue that might not be realistic, but this will depend on the firm. So what I'll do is we'll assume that our interest expense every single year is the same as it was in the previous year. Next, we need taxes. 
and taxes are going to be calculated as our EBIT minus our interest expense, since it's tax deductible, and multiplied by our tax rate. In this case, 20%. We're given that. And so what I'll do is I'll put a dollar sign in front of the C, a dollar sign in, in front of the 4, and I will copy that across. There we go. Notice that our tax expense is increasing, but that's because our operating income is also increasing. Finally, we need our net income. And net income is EBIT minus our interest minus our tax expense. And we will copy that across. Next, PP&E. So gross PP&E, just without the effects of depreciation, uh, we're assuming that PPE grows at a an 8% rate given in cell C5. So what we'll do is we'll multiply our PP&E in the current year by 1 plus C5. And we'll put dollar signs in front of that and assume that, well we, well, we just want to lock that in. And so I'll copy that across. And now we can estimate the change in PPE because we have PPE in the previous year, the current year, and then all five of these pro forma or forecasted years. So I've already got this formula in here. Our change in PPE is just the PP&E in the current year minus PPE in the previous year. So what I'll do is I'll just copy this formula across, or rather I'll just go ahead and calculate it as current year or the latest year minus the previous year. And there we go. Okay, next we need depreciation. And depreciation expense, we're going to assume that depreciation as a percentage of PP&E is 14.286. The reason I chose that is because that is one seventh. And so that would be a, a, a rough ballpark if the majority of our PPE or rather the weighted average uh, and so the reason I chose that is because if our company is maintaining a large amount of property, so furniture or agricultural equipment, those assets tend to depreciate over seven years. Some longer term assets will depreciate over longer. Other assets will depreciate over a shorter schedule, but we'll just assume a seven year depreciation schedule. So that'll be our depreciation percentage. So what I'll do is I will assume that we have a change in uh, PPE and we want to multiply that by our depreciation percentage and I'll lock in that depreciation percentage. And there we go. Okay, next. We need our change in working capital. And notice here that we're just going to assume that our net working capital growth is zero. The reason I include that input is because it can't just always grow. It can't just always be positive year over year over year. That would mean that you're, you know, you're holding more cash or you're decreasing current liabilities forever. I mean, certainly eventually that will have to turn around. And so your your change in networking capital over infinity should be pretty close to zero. So that's that's exactly what I'll do. I'll just put in zero here and I'll just copy that over. And net debt issued, just go ahead and for this example, we'll assume the firm paid or borrowed no additional funds and repaid no principal. So here we'll just say zero. Okay, so now we can estimate our free cash flows. And so here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my EBIT, so operating income, and I'll put some parentheses around that. And I'll multiply that by quantity of one minus our corporate tax rate. 
So just using the FCFF formula that I gave in the slides. And I'll add to that our depreciation expense. Since it's a non-cash ex expense, it's been taken out of the income statement, or rather out of operating income, or rather you, we've subtracted that from our, our revenue and uh, it decreases our bottom line, but because it's it's a non-cash expense, we need to add it back in because we're we care about cash flow, not accounting income. All right, next we subtract out our change in PPE, and lastly we subtract out our change in net working capital. And there we go, FCFF. We'll copy that. Ah, we have something that has changed that we need to account for. Yes, so. I failed to lock in our tax rate in cell C4. So what I'll do is I'll put some dollar signs in front of that and I will copy that across. There we go. All right, next we have a need to calculate our free cash flows after the fifth year, after year T plus five. And there's two ways that we can do that. First way, we'll use the constant growth formula. And so what we'll do is we'll take our the quantity of our free cash flow in year five or the fifth pro forma year, so 20 aught six, and we'll multiply that by one plus our long-term growth rate. And here we'll just assume that that long-term growth rate is the same as the long-term growth rate in the U.S. economy, so 2%. So there we go. And we will divide that by our weighted average cost of capital minus the growth rate. And there we go. Now notice here that this value, the 16,338, this is significantly larger than our free cash flows in the first five years. And this is one of the big drawbacks to the free cash flows to the firm or the, the two-stage DCF model with FC. Uh, with uh, free cash flows, is that your terminal value will dominate this this valuation. I mean, it could represent 60, 80 percent of the, the overall value of the firm. So what I'm trying to convey here is that if your growth rate is off or if your weighted average cost of capital is off, uh, that can really throw off your valuation. All right, next we want to sum up our free cash flows. In each period, there's you know several ways to do this. I just do this because in this last year we have not just the free cash flow from year 20 aught six. We also have the terminal value cash flow, and so our total cash flow in the fifth pro forma year is about 17,300. All right, next let's repeat this process, but this time we will get our mark our terminal value using market multiples. So here we use the exact same formula. It's going to be our operating income times one minus our corporate tax rate. Put some dollar signs in front of that. We'll add to that our depreciation and subtract, subtract out our change in PPE and our change in networking capital. And notice here that we get the exact same values as up here. That's because we're using the exact same formula. I could have just copied it. The difference here comes in when we estimate our terminal value. And here we're using market multiples to calculate our terminal value. And there's a couple of reasons why we might want to do this. The big reason is that perhaps we don't really know what the long-term growth rate of our firm's free cash flows are. Let's say this is a tech firm or some, some other firm where estimation of free cash flows after the fifth year is just, it's not going to be accurate. Well, what we can do is we can assume that our firm's growth prospects are comparable to those of its direct competitors. And if our direct competitor has a price-to-sales ratio of 360, well, why not just use that to estimate the price of our stock at the end of year five? 
So that's exactly what we'll do. We'll take our firms. In this case, we're looking for sales per share because we're going to multiply that by the price to sales ratio. So we want sales per share. So we'll take 39.72 divided by shares outstanding. So this entire thing is going to be sales per share. And we multiply that by our competitor's price to sales ratio. And there we go. Our terminal value using free cash flows to the firm is 7150, which is significantly lower. So apparently our well, investors are anticipating that our competitor will grow at a much slower rate or grow its cash flows at a much slower rate than the overall economy after the fifth year. So we'll repeat our process of summing up all of our cash flows. And then we'll move on. Now, the final approach involves us using free cash flows to equity. And for this one, we're going to be using this formula. So we have our free cash flows to the firm in each period. We know our interest expense. We know our corporate tax rate. And we know the change in debt, which in this example will just be zero. So here, what we'll do is we'll plug in our free cash flow, which is just in cells E29 and E34. And we'll subtract from that our interest expense, because that's going to the bondholders, times our 1 minus tax rate. And we'll add to that our net debt, or debt issued. And we should lock in our, our tax rate here, just because we don't want that thing changing as we carry this formula across. So there we go. And now we want to calculate the terminal value of the FCFE. So we'll take our FCFE in the fifth year, put some parentheses around it first. Multiply by 1 plus our growth rate. So again, we'll just assume that's 2%. And divide all of that by our required return minus the growth rate. There we go. And we'll sum all of those up. And just to save some time, I'll copy this formula from the last one. There we go. Now we have our free cash flows using three different methods. And we can calculate the intrinsic value using each of these methods. We'll assume that we have $3,000 in debt and 150 in cash and 200 shares outstanding. So first things first, let's calculate the intrinsic value using free cash flows to the firm and the constant growth in the terminal value. So I'll use the NPV formula. And my rate, my discount rate, is going to be the weighted average cost of capital because we have free cash flows to the firm. And that represents free cash flows to not just the shareholders, but also the bondholders and preferred shareholders. Next, we highlight our free cash flows. Just right here, our total free cash flows. There we go. And then we will take our NPV, subtract out the debt, and add the cash. And this represents our intrinsic market cap, our intrinsic market value of equity. Last step, divide that by the number of shares outstanding. In this case, 5849. All right, next, we want the NPV using the market multiples approach. And this approach what we're going to do is we're going to again use our weighted average cost of capital as our discount rate. Then we'll highlight our stream of cash flows. So we're discounting those back to the present. 
Our intrinsic market value of equity or intrinsic market cap is just NPV minus debt plus cash. And then we're going to divide that by shares outstanding. So we're getting a much lower valuation here. Uh, that's that's consistent with the lower growth expectations that analysts, or rather investors, placed on our comparable firm. Now, finally, FCFE. So same thing. Use the NPV formula. And this time, our discount rate is going to be the required return because it represents the return on equity only. And we have free cash flows here that are only going to the, the shareholders. So we'll highlight our total FCFE. And now we just divide our intrinsic market cap by shares outstanding. And there we go. So we have three different metrics of intrinsic value, each calculated using a different method. And so what we do now is, well, initially, let's just see how they stack up relative to the current share price. So each of these metrics gives us an intrinsic value that is significantly larger than the current share price. And if we're just going off of this, we would typically say that this stock is undervalued since its its actual value is probably somewhere amongst this range. Uh, but usually before you, you want to make any investment decision, you're going to want to use something like Monte Carlo simulation, scenario analysis, sensitivity analysis, look at what happens when you change some of your inputs, what happens when you allow them to adjust randomly following a probability distribution, regardless uh, of the method, you do need to do some additional testing. You're not finished once you get here. Uh, but this is a pretty good sign that this company, assuming our inputs are fairly accurate, might actually be undervalued. So that's that. Now, before I wrap up, I do have a couple of problems that I do want to highlight with the two-stage DCF model. The first one is something that would certainly persist for a long time if there was some kind of worldwide pandemic or worldwide plague or something like that. You know, who knows when the next one of those might be. <laughs> uh, but, you know, your cash flows can actually be negative all the way through the term all the way through the, the forecasting period and then into the terminal value period. And when you see something like this, your two-stage DCF model is not going to be appropriate. Uh, let me give you an example. Let's say we were estimating the intrinsic value of an airline and the airline was not expected to be profitable or turn or offer positive free cash flows over the next five or six years. So that final forecasting your free cash flow could be negative, and we're basing all of our future free cash flows on that free cash flow. So if we were to use the two-stage DCF model with these negative free cash flows, we're going to get a negative valuation. This is a case where this is not appropriate. This two-stage DCF is not appropriate. Another drawback would be if our sales forecasts were not accurate. So let's say there's a change or uh, well, we'll say a change in macroeconomic or industry conditions, and that throws off our, our sales growth rate numbers. Well, in that case, our valuation is going to be horribly inaccurate. It could be the case that that changes, or maybe we've just failed to account for some factors in the local economy or the, the actual industry where the firm operates. So, Essentially, data accuracy and uh, forecast accuracy is a big issue to us here. Next, capital expenditures don't grow at an even rate. It's very unusual to see a, a linear growth in CapEx year over year over year. CapEx, or PPE, it typically grows in a step function. So you might see a very large capital expenditure this year, maybe much smaller value next year, and then another very big purchase or set of purchases the year after that. The downside is we have to try and estimate that, which is extremely difficult. You want to be as accurate as you possibly can, and this does involve reading a lot about what the firm's management is 
likely to do if they put out any statements. Uh, maybe they, they in the annual shareholders meeting, the CEO gives a statement about where the firm is going in the next couple of years, and you might be able to estimate whether the PP&E is likely to grow going forward at a, a very high rate, or they might mention something in the, in the MD&A statement. Okay, next, each forecasted value is open to debate. This is one of the biggest issues to the DCF model or the two-stage DCF model. The problem here is that literally every input that you have in the forecasting period, it, it's not 100%. It, it's not going to be 100% accurate. We're looking for the most accurate value that we can get, but unfortunately, that's that's not going to happen. We're not ever going to perfectly estimate the value of the firm. And so this is why we, we do want to have that conversation with uh, other other individuals at our at our fund at our you know anyone we're we're investing with uh, so it it is a conversation and the more conversation about the likelihood of some uh, particular growth rate in a line item uh, it is is probably better and then finally accounting choices do present interpretation issues uh, different firms will use different methods to calculate, let's say, the, the cost of goods sold or, uh, let's say, the net income if we're just using net income and the free cash flows to the firm method. Downside here is that different accounting choices will lead us to have different intrinsic values, and we don't really know exactly all of the accounting choices that the firm made. We can look through the the notes of the financial statements to get a sense of what choices have been made in the past, but we're not going to have a, a perfect perfect sense of all of the accounting choices that were made by the the firm's accountants. So where does this model fit in with our other models for valuation? Well, our two-stage and three-stage DCF models, they require the firm that we're analyzing to have a, a moderate level of cash flow volatility. And eventually we expect that that firm's cash flow volatility to essentially be eliminated. It, it should at some point become a mature firm operating in a mature market. And that means that it should offer a constantly growing level of free cash flows. Now, the two stage assumes that cash flow will grow at some uneven rate potentially over the next three to five years. Your three stage DCF model can extend a bit further. Let's say your your forecasting period is you know one year, three years, five years, whatever, and then you assume a high growth rate or higher than average in the overall economy growth rate, and then eventually your firm's discounted cash flows or your firm's cash flows will grow only at the long-term growth rate of, you know, two, maybe 3%, something like that. So we typically like to use these two models to value mature firms or firms that are fairly large and likely to mature in the next couple of years. We also want to make sure that we're not using this model on firms that do have negative cash flows. The benefit of using this model is that it is extremely flexible. It is absolutely one of the most flexible models out there. You don't need to have dividends for your firm. You don't need to have positive free cash flows initially, uh, but it does require that your, your cash flows do stabilize eventually. All right, to summarize, these multi-stage models, the two-stage and the three-stage models, they are absolutely more flexible than other models like the, the constant growth rate, dividend discount model, or the market multiples model. They are most appropriate when your firm does have free cash flows that are positive. So we either want positive free cash flows today, or we should expect those free cash flows very soon. Because if we don't see that, it could lead to a negative valuation, which means our this is not an appropriate valuation technique. Next, these models are absolutely not appropriate if you're having difficulty forecasting your sales growth rate or some other components. These models assume that you're going to be able to provide some accurate estimate of at least sales growth and hopefully a couple of other components, other line items. If not, the better method is probably going to be market multiples. Next, 
your two-stage models do allow you or some other analyst or investor to account for current market conditions that just aren't going to persist over the next three years, five years, what have you. So let's say you're in the middle of a pandemic and share prices and free cash flows for certain airline companies or cruise companies are extremely depressed. Maybe they're running a, a negative free cash flow to the firm, free cash flow to equity. Uh, th those conditions will hopefully turn around as we emerge from a pandemic. And so that's a big benefit of the DCF models or the two-stage and three-stage DCF models. Uh, finally, the three-stage DCF models allow your, your model to be even more flexible than the two-stage. It's just that these models are slightly more complicated. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. And if you have any questions, please come talk to me, email me, call me, what have you. Thank you.